Welcome, Ramon. Take it away. Uh, yes, so uh, this talk is going to be a bit like more engineering uh, compared to some of the other talks that we have uh, seen, which is more like the political aspects of uh, force. Here we would like to talk about these uh, data formats, which is Agro and uh, Parket, and I will go a bit deeper into what we are talking about and why this is relevant. So this is what we will be seeing in this talk. Uh, yeah, a bit about Pandora. Not many people know what Pandora is, and a bit about myself as well. Also the matching of expectation. What will you get out of this talk by watching it? Uh, so yeah, we will explain a bit about that. We will go into the background, why did we make this a FOSS library, so other people could probably also use it, and what it is, what we have provided. Hopefully, uh, I will be able to do a small demo, and if I run out of time, yeah, we might skip the demo, but if I have more time besides the demo, I will also jump into the code. At the end, we will more or less summarize, and yeah, we will have, uh, hopefully, time to do some uh, Q&A. So a bit about Pandora, uh, it's uh, one of the biggest companies in Denmark, you can see we have 32,000 employees, but it started out in 1982 as a small shop in Copenhagen, and you can see like 40 years after, it's from maybe two or three employees all the way to 32,000. So uh, this uh, biggest uh, jewelry brand in the world is actually known for these uh, charms, which is something that you can put on the bracelet, so here we have the Guardians of the Galaxy with uh, Rocket and Root. So we can use those uh, IP because we have this deal with uh, Disney. That means that we also have charms for Star Wars, Marvel and so on and so forth. Uh, I have put in bold uh, these uh, most important parts. So in 2020, everything we were doing is actually done on 100% renewable energy and we expect to be CO2 neutral by 2025. Also in 2021, we introduced like lab-created diamonds. So yeah, and, and the reason I put emphasis in this one is has to do also why we did this uh, to uh, open sourced. A bit about myself: I work at Pandora as a lead tech slash architect, where I create software like this. Not everything is open source, but uh, yeah, it's mostly closed source. Uh, I already gave some talks at FOSS uh, North. I was on-site in 2019, and in 2020 I gave uh, one of the virtual ones. When I introduced myself in the description of the talk, I mentioned myself as a pathologist, and that is the term uh, coined by Peter Nauer. Uh, that's the way he describes uh, computer science in Denmark, right? And his good friend Dijkstra, uh, it's mostly based on this sentence, that computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. If any of you saw the talk yesterday from Jose on a GNU poke, he was actually mentioning or doing the teasing that he was going to do an Algol 68 talk. And there would be no Algol 68 without Peter Nauer or Dijkstra, and there would, we, would, we probably wouldn't have the tooling that we have today without Algol 68. So I was a bit sad that we didn't get to see like the Algol 68 talk from Jose, but maybe Johan can get him next year for Force North to talk about that. So, yeah, the matching of expectation is that we will try to showcase that this tool we have actually made, where we can trans uh, transform like the data between Avro and the nested data contained in that data format into targets. Yeah, so we, we will actually showcase how by doing this we can maybe reduce uh, the amount of storage that we use, and if we reduce the amount of storage, we can probably also reduce the amount of CPU cycles that we have to move uh, data all, uh, all around between all these layers in our data lakes. Uh, right now we have an ongoing uh, collaboration with Microsoft and the climate team where we need to get these numbers as effects. We cannot just claim that we're going to reduce CO2, uh, we're going to reduce uh, storage. We need to have uh, factual checks. So we're still awaiting those numbers and as soon as we get it we will update uh, our GitHub profile uh, project. Yeah, the tool is available under a FOSS license and you can get the library at NuGet and you can get the source code at uh, our GitHub uh, profile. Uh, normally I say I would like questions but I will uh, expect you to uh, yeah, and, uh, make, a, make your questions at the end because 
That way we can actually see if we are complying with the time, so we don't mess with the, the schedule of uh, today. So the background, uh, why is this even relevant for us as a company, right? So as many other companies, we are jumping on board of Kafka, which is this uh, distributed event streaming uh, platform that is also an open source component and it was initially uh, uh, implemented by LinkedIn but they gave the ownership to the Apache uh, Foundation. So the reason why so many companies, and especially the big ones, jump on board of Kafka is because it has this capability of providing scalable, real-time uh, integrations. So due to this fact, and also that we are transitioning into this data mess strategy, and one of the key concepts of data mess that you need to define this domain-driven, ubiquitous uh, common language, and for us, since we go on with Kafka, we will rely on Avros IDL, which is a small DSL, to define uh, the schemas in the Avro format. And by doing this, we actually uh, specify like the representation of our data. So our subject matter expert, domain expert, development and product teams, as well as code, and of course, any other stakeholders that might find this data relevant, we all have this common representation of the data. So whenever the slides will get uh, distributed afterwards, I will suggest you uh, to go visit Confluence website and look at this uh, blog post uh, written based on a use case of uh, Saxo Bank, which is a Danish bank, where they describe really, really well like the approach of DDD plus uh, data mesh. So uh, one of the good things we get uh, by having Kafka is that our integration going forward will be system to Kafka and Kafka to system. So we have all been, well, at least I have been many years in, in, in IT and doing these kind of projects. So what happens is that you most of the times when you purchase or create a new system is that you do system to system integration. And when you do that part, most of the time you get more data than you probably need. But that data you don't want to lose it, so what you do is you actually expand your targeting system with a lot of uh, entities just to be able to store that data that you're getting from a system A into the system B. What you do when you do this uh, approach or when you use this approach is that you actually introduce technical depth into your system B because you have to maintain it with something that might never be used, right? So the whole point with having this, you can say maybe like uh, integration hoop in Kafka is that now we can just send the data as it is into Kafka and whenever you consume it, you just need to take the data that's relevant for the system. Uh, so Kafka is built on this event-driven architecture. So the important part of the EDA is the communication strategy is how do we actually ensure that data from A can get all the way to B. But we have no persistent strategy. That also means that Kafka will not live very long uh, there, so it will only have a short period of time. So it's very important that when you introduce a streaming platform as Kafka, that you also think about uh, introducing like event sourcing, because the important part of event sourcing is the persistent strategy. So event sourcing for us, we are going to combine it with our data mesh architecture, where we will uh, put the data into uh, our data lakes. So. What we notice is that this other format is really, really good uh, when you work with Kafka and real-time streaming, but once you want to put it into the data lake so you can work with it afterwards as uh, data engineers, data scientists and business analysts are working with, the other format is not really good. Uh, I will showcase a few examples why, where this is the case. So what we really want to do is we want to utilize the platforms and the tooling that uh, the data uh, teams are actually using at the moment, and therefore we need to put uh, or we need to transform like the Avro data into the Parget. And if anybody has uh, worked with Parget, and if you don't have the, the, the important concept of Parget, if you compare it to a CSV file or a tab generated uh, file, is that instead of being row, row based, it's actually column based. So that allows you to do some more efficient uh, work uh, on the data. It also supports data compression and encoding of schemes and yeah, it performs really well with big chunks of uh, bulk data. 
So the approach we are using when it comes to uh, the architecture of uh, our data mess, uh, it will be this uh, well-known pattern that is described by Databricks and Microsoft and many other companies, where you have like a separated layers uh, for, for medallions, so you have the bronze, where you just have the landing data all raw, then you have the silver, where you have done a bit of cleaning, filtering, Augmented, which is normally what you call curated and rich and so on and so forth. And finally, the gold is where you actually have the data as knowledge. The data as knowledge is normally what your ML models will be built on or your uh, reporting tools will consume in order to expose uh, what you're working with. So, so the, the, the platforms that we are using is uh, actually uh, Spark slash uh, Databricks and just a a, a thing about Databricks. So Databricks is a company in the Silicon Valley. Uh, besides being a company, Azure Databricks is like the instance and implementation of a tool that is built on Sparks, which is hosted by Microsoft Azure. And Databricks as a company is uh, actually implementing uh, a tool called Delta Lake, which is now owned by the Linux Foundation. So it happens all the time. You see projects reusing the same name for different things. So perhaps we should be better the, not just open source, but in software to say, okay, so this is our company, we provide this product, and we provide this other product. Because sometimes it's a bit confusing when you have to explain something and you just see the same terminology meaning uh, several things. So I just wanted to make that clear. So the built-in uh, uh, tool uh, that where you can actually convert Avro into Parkit uh, Sparks slash Databricks uh, for persistent capabilities. Like the main issue, what we notice is that you take this R file and you just, with all the nested data, you just create a single target file with all the nested data as well. So you didn't do anything at all, right? In case I need to have a small subset of data in one of the nested uh, recursive uh, entities, I have to take the whole file, I have to load it into a data lake table, and then I can be begin to drill down and I had to flatten and, and so on and so forth. So the problem with this is that you have to do a lot of manual work and that becomes tedious but also costly. And yeah. The other uh, tooling that we have is also built in, uh, in Spark and Databricks, is that you can connect directly to your Kafka platform and you can consume the data, read and write. But it's still the same, so you will get the arm down and you still need to do all the flattening as before and you need to recursively go down and so on and so forth. Uh, so the problem with hooking up something real-time from Spark's Databricks is that you need to use a cluster. So the clusters could go from, uh, we're talking about 24-7, so they will go from 400 uh, USD a month all the way to 925 USD a month. And that's just for one cluster running let's say, against one topic uh, in your Kafka, right? When we develop our small, lightweight containers in .NET or uh, Java, we can put those into our Kubernetes, and those containers might cost uh, 10 to 15 euros, right? If we use this uh, container app that uh, the Azure platform is actually providing, where you don't have to deal with uh, Kubernetes, then you go a bit up. But still, like you can see like the difference between 15 euros for a small lightweight container that do exactly the same thing as what the cluster does. I mean, that's like not even an option, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a factor of, yeah, yeah, 10 or 20, no, it's maybe more like 90, right? 90 times the price, so it, it, it's not a real option uh, to do that. So what is what we have uh, done here? So we would like to present this uh, tool that we mean or we think it's actually novel and could become state-of-the-art solution in order to do this transformation between the Avro uh, data format into Parget. But we do it in a fully automated way. We don't want to have our engineers, uh, our data engineers, our data scientists having to consume the data, flatten it and do that all the time, right? We want to have it fully automated. Also, like, we still think that Avro is the right format for Kafka, and we still think Parget is the right format for our data lakes. They are, in their sense, very optimized and cost-effective, 
in their platforms, but we don't want to uh, swap them around. What we do here, like the way we sold these nested data elements, as I mentioned in the description, is that we will provide these kind of extension tables, right? So the next slide I will go more into detail. When we say extension tables, uh, what it is actually what I'm meaning. So by doing this, we will actually show how we can combine several layers, combining like raw uh, layers with validated, deduplicated, and that will actually make it easier to provide uh, data in the goal layer, which is uh, data as knowledge for our data engineer scientist and uh, business analyst, right? So when I talk about extension tables, uh, this is just the star schema or the snowflake schema. So uh, for us, uh, an event in Kafka is like a fact table, right? You get an event and all the related nested data elements, they just become dimension tables, right? So what happened in these cases is that we have sometimes some recursively nested uh, tables, dimension tables to our dimension tables. So we are more in the, uh, in the snowflake uh, schema diagrams, right? Because we do recursively. I think one of our data definition has 17 nested elements. So I would just say try to go 17 times down manually in your uh, language of uh, yeah, Python or Scala, whatever you're using in Spark slash Databricks, try to do a flattening on that, right? So that's not really a viable solution. So what benefits do we actually get by using these kind of star snowflake schemas, which is like a well-accepted approach uh, in, in, in data uh, architecture? So we will get way simpler queries it's very easy to write uh, simple SQL queries where you can retrieve the data once you know how uh, the facts and the dimension tables are defined. You will also get simplified reporting logic based on this. Your queries can become uh, faster, like uh, performance-wise, and this might only work with read only. And, and this is actually perfectly fine for us because like, the tooling that we use have uh, capability or uh, atomic uh, capabilities are pending, so we will have this immutable uh, data, uh, yeah, immutable data storage uh, for each of these entities. So we will be able to make our read queries, and we know that we're just going to append, so we're not going to do any modifies, updates, or and so on and so forth. So the performance gain will uh, still uh, count. Also, like once we want to uh, get the data to uh, to the goal layer, uh, then fast aggregations, or we will also get fast aggregations. And what we get with this approach is that we get an efficient and a compact storage of normalized data. Since we have already defined or well defined our data in contracts in the Avro ADL specification, of course our data is normalized. Once the, uh, the slides get available, I will kindly suggest you to link on that uh, link where you can actually see how you can query one trillion rows in this approach with one fact a table with two dimensions and one aggregate. You can actually query the whole thing in just a few seconds. I think it's seven or six, seven seconds. Uh, the, the key concept here is that it needs to be on the delta lake. So I will come a bit more into details why the delta lake here is important. So the nested uh, data types that I mentioned uh, in the description that we had the right, uh, right, uh, right types, map types and union types. For us uh, to be able to represent uh, those uh, nested and complex uh, types uh, in extension tables, we actually need to do a, a little pre-trick before we run it through, a, a, well it's actually a tooling that does it. But what we do is we just transform these uh, types into a record. So arrays will become a record of items of type T. A map of type T will become a We have a key, which is a string, and then we have the value of type T. And then we have the union, which is just a list of types. So we will just have one element uh, set in, in, in this record of type zero, where we have the first type all the way to type N. So once we have done that, 
we can use the open source uh, NuGet library provided by the Apache uh, Software Foundation where they have this uh, representation of ge uh, generic records. So once we have a generic record, we can actually instantiate our data in that uh, class instance and then we can apply our tooling to it so we can uh, tr uh, transform that generic record into uh, the schema of the IST of our packet representation. That goes really, really fast and you only have to do it once for each of these uh, uh, Avro IDL specifications. So, one of the important parts of the Avro IDL specification where you can define the contracts is that it supports the ALM, right? Like the application life cycles uh, management. So, if you had a standard that is always like the same, it's very difficult to have like a, a, a software system that uh, evolves with the business, right? So, they actually support this changes of schemas, but what I notice is that in order to ensure that this change in the schema doesn't break your uh, uh, table definitions in the data lake, we have uh, done a small uh, trick which I have uh, stolen from the Nix, Nix OS uh, uh, community, which is actually the way that they hash a table, right? So once you get, uh, I think it's easier to just show it, you can see it. So here we will have, uh, I'm going to start the JDK in this uh, sandbox terminal with a Nix shell. So now we can see that the Java version is the, the latest as list, uh, at least at NixOS, which is 17, right? So now we can say which, where is the Java binary placed, so we can see it's here. And the same for JDK 11, so we can say Java version 11, and now we can say where is that binary place. So you can see I'm able to run two different versions of Java, we have no collisions whatsoever, and the trick is the tarballs will actually generate the hash which differs from those two packages, right? So let's say that I made a mistake. So I didn't update the semantic versioning of the package, but th thankfully NixOS will say, okay, the table that you have provided me doesn't have the same, the same binary size, so whenever I do the hash, we will for sure put it in a bucket that will not collide with 11, right? So even though you, as a person, don't actually make the changes that's necessary, like the system will actually help you ensure that you don't make colliding uh, issues with your binaries. So this is a bit what we have implemented into this uh, library as well. So uh, as, as long as we have the same data of the sign version, it will go to one bucket. As soon as we modify some elements from that bucket, it will go to another one. That will give all the data teams the possibility to actually implement the new logic and modify their queries, right? But they will not have a breaking solution as sometimes happen, right? Somebody deletes a property field on a table or somebody implements something and, and, and you get all kind of uh, uh, broken uh, data pipelines. So, and you can see here, maybe it's a bit too small, but on the left side, this is like the representation of the fact tables and the extension tables and inside of those tables we add this uh, unique hash to ensure that a given version goes to, to, to that placement. So here's the important part of the data lake versus the delta lake. So the delta lake, uh, it has this uh, separate folder where it has some JSON-L control files. What they do is they specify some metadata with regard of what's data uh, inside of these uh, different uh, data entities. So this will actually help you uh, when you do your query, right? Uh, we, we, we do like the partition on a date stamp. So every time we put in data, we can ensure that it goes into, let's say, 2023, April, and then uh, 25, which is the day. So that will ensure that if you only want data from today, you can easily and with almost no CPU power uh, exclude all those uh, data elements. If we rely on a data lake as it is, 
we would have to take all the packet files from all the folders, we would have to load them into uh, data lake tables, then we have to go through them all. Oh, we can see that you are the wrong date, so we will skip it, but that would be too costly. So, if you don't have delta lakes implemented in your data lake, please do. So, yeah, we had some goals whenever we created this tool. So, yeah, one of the, the important ones was this ripple ethic, right? So, we spent a lot of time with the domain experts to actually try to represent the data that we are going to use in the different system on a business level definition that everybody should be able to understand, right? So, what we really want to do is we want to ripple that definitions to as many systems as possible in, in an automated way. We don't want to spend a lot of time like, oh, going again, defining and defining and defining. That we should have a uh, tooling to do that. Also, like the onboarding process, right? So, normally you have to create these uh, consumer producers or subscribers and uh, publishers. It's the same naming, but it's just, uh, yeah. So, what we want to do initially is we want to say, okay, so if you just put focus on creating the producers, yeah then you will get the consumer for free because you just point to a given data lake and you will have the, like the, the data available there. Like the delta lake, that was absolutely mandatory for this tooling. If we didn't have delta lake support, uh, this uh, tool probably wouldn't be use, uh, would be useless. So, as I say, and we show from the, uh, uh, from the example before, like one trillion rows, you can actually go through them in only six, seven seconds. And yeah. So, yeah, you can do the fast queries and so on and so forth. An important part here is that the Delta Lake is actually cloud agnostic. So even though it's Databricks that is creating this uh, or implementing this tool, it's not only bound to Azure. User friendliness, data teams are used to actually utilizing some tooling and it doesn't really make sense that because we have chosen like a new streaming platform, that they have to forget everything they have been doing in Python and Scala or whatever it is, and now they should only implement uh, consumers and producers uh, as the way it's uh, more or less defined by, yeah, by Kafka. Automation and cost and time reduction, yeah. As I mentioned, we just want to put uh, in some configuration, yeah, consume from this topic, put it into this data lake in some kind of uh, data flow pipeline, and that should be it. You shouldn't do anything at all. And also like uh, the, sus the sus uh, sustainability journey that Pandora is ongoing, like we really want to have, uh, yeah, uh, if we can avoid uh, using a lot of uh, storage, servers, CPU power, and so on and so forth, yeah, we would like to do that because we have this uh, goal in uh, 2025 to be CO2 uh, neutral, right? So everything we can do from software to help do that, it's just not uh, with regard of the crafting of the jewelry, but it's every single aspect of, of the business. So this is the part I will showcase in the demo. What we have on the right side, this is normally how you will specify it, uh, uh, like a data contract description in this Avro IDO, which is like the ubiquitous common language that you are using in the domain-driven design approach for our, our data mesh. What we're doing is we're actually representing that as an ER diagram, so it's easier to actually do the queries when you can visualize how uh, the different uh, tables, fact tables and dimension tables are actually joined with uh, cardinality. I think it's a bit too small, but when I showcase it afterwards, I hopefully it will be a bit bigger. So yeah, uh, invest in the data producer, just put data into Kafka and then just use this generic sync or archive a consumer which is built with a library, point to a data mess and then we will actually put the data in there. So what we do with this um, uh, sync or archive a consumer is that normally when you look into like the Delta Lake Medallion architecture, you can see that you have on the, on the right side, either you have streaming or you have batching, right? But we actually in between those two, so you have some semaphores, you have one for timing, which is like you can say every five minutes, 
store it in the delta leg or the data leg, but we can also like do uh, concurrently at the same time an upper bound for the buffer, right? So you can say, well, every five minutes put the data into the delta leg, but if you reach 10,000 elements, just push it, right? So when there's like high payloads or continuously high payloads, you can keep pushing big amounts of data, like in a streaming way, but when we have low uh, payloads over uh, time, we can every five minutes just maybe push a few uh, elements. And whoever says five minutes could be one minute, can be two minutes, can be ten minutes, can be fifty minutes. Real timeness depends from system to system, company to company. So, yeah, maybe just sending that information every one minute is still consi uh, considered real time, and maybe sending that information every hour or every day is also considered real time, right? So it always depends in the case. This is why we need to provide you a configuration parameter where you can provide this time interval uh, semaphore as well. So yeah, as I mentioned, the Delta Lake is also an open source uh, software uh, project and it's implemented by Databricks, but the ownership is now the Linux Foundation, which is exactly the same thing that happened with uh, Kafka and the Apache Software Foundation. And as I mentioned, is cloud agnostic, so as long as you have one of those delta lakes in the bottom, you can just provide this uh, layer on top. And by doing that, by providing this layer, you have uh, all the capabilities where you can do the auto-purging, removal of uh, partitions that are not really relevant. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's too small, but here we can see these uh, unique hashes that we're adding and they are not really that distracting, so normally you will not put those in, but you can see this one is for the first version and for the further versions you can inside your query just add a union between version 1 and let's say version 2 and now it's just your responsibility how you will uh, bubble up the common fields between those two elements, right? So let's say in version 1 we didn't have a field called foo, but now we have it in version 2. So what you can do is you can actually make a static field here where you will say that foo is just a dummy or a null value or whatever it is, right? So whenever you do the aggregation uh, of the two elements and you are using them in your pipeline, it will just get uh, that information. So uh, the Delta Lake actually has an auto-merging function and I'm always worried that when you put stuff in uh, you're not really uh, sure of how those uh, elements will be combined together. So I would rather have a bit of uh, copy-pasting and just uh, ensuring that my elements are actually uh, uniform between the two queries. Uh, but again, yeah, that's... Uh, at least this will not break, so if I don't implement version 2, we will just not get the data, but there's nothing that will break the version 1 part of the data at the top. So, yeah, so what I'm showing you here is just a Python notebook, so inside of the Python notebook you can make an SQL cell, and now you can see here at the bottom, so we retrieve the data with SQL, which is normally more readable than Python or Scala, and you can see here at the bottom, once you run that SQL cell, you actually get the data frame in Python. So now you can do all the uh, post-processing as you are used to. Yeah, so the automation and cost time. Yeah, so, so what we're claiming now is that since we have a really high quality of data because we have to find it in the data contracts of the RIDL, so now we're not just putting data into a landing page and that data is raw and we have to work on it. No, no. Now what we're doing is we ensure that whatever data we're getting, it has to comply with what we have specified in our data contract and we put that into Kafka. Once we have that really nice data formalized there, now we should be able to take it and put it into 
the data lake, right? So since we already have this full raw historical of each data, si uh, data sets in a defined structure enforcing the schema as well as validated and deduplicated, we actually claim that well, we don't really need a branch in a silver layer, right? Now we just need the combination of those two layers. So we take that data, we just put it in, and now the people uh, defining the goal layers, it could be the views for the reporting tools, or it could be the ML data models. Now they just need to consume that data, right? Maybe make some aggregation or whatever they're doing. But they can just take some really, really good quality data from the data lake without having to yeah, as you can see in the example here. So, normally, uh, and, I, and I don't know how many people here work with data engineering on a daily basis, this is more or less what you're seeing. So, you get some data source and you put it in some landing layer, which is what we call raw. Then you take the raw, you do some stuff there, you put it in enrich. Then the enrich, you do something more, then it's curated. Then the curated, you do a bit more, and then it's ready for development, and you also need to archive it for historical immutable event store purposes. Okay, now the fifth step, now we can begin to create our views for reporting, and yes, the sixth step, now it's where we can begin to bind the visualization of that reporting. So, you can see there's a lot of manual things that you need to do, a lot of manual steps, and that's both a lot of engineering resources, but as well as uh, uh, CPU cycles, data storage, servers, and so on and so forth. So that's what we try to mitigate with this uh, tooling. So what you can see from the uh, initial bullet points when I introduce uh, Pandora as a company is that Pandora has a uh, some visions on becoming a sustainability leader, right? So we do a lot for sustainability and the environment. So 100% renewable energy, we're already there. We want to be CO2 neutral. The gold and the silver we are using, if we can re uh, get it from recycled gold and silver, we actually do that. lab grown diamonds, we actually ditching mine diamonds. We're not going to use any mine diamonds uh, anymore. So. When the, the slides get shared, please read this CNS, CNN business article where you can see our CEO is actually telling that. And that's 2021 already, right? We're 2023. So we also have these uh, sustainability rep reports that you can go in if you re will read more about this uh, uh, approach from Pandora. So again, by merging these two medallion layers into a single, of course, it could lead. Again, we have to wait for the real numbers provided by the climate team, the climate team as well as Microsoft, but it seems possible if you combine two layers which have more or less the same data, a bit more enriched into a single one, we can actually have some really good savings on the disk usage, right? Uh, you might have seen that we didn't go the naive approach, so perhaps maybe instead of the third, it might be, might be let's say, a third, and a bit more we can actually uh, reduce so, one of the things, and this is also one of the ideas why we want to open source uh, this tool, right? Uh, the talk uh, just before mine is open source is not all about money. If we can actually ensure that we reduce uh, usage of servers, uh, storage, CPU cycles, and so on, like the CO2 emissions, what we are going to do are going to be less, right? So, if we can actually share this way or this approach or this uh, methodology to other people who want to do it, that can have an impact on global scale, right? That, that's not just for the uh, economic purposes, right? This is it actually, we have one world, one globe, and we all need to take care of it, right? So this is also one of the main goals for us. We want to share this methodology or this approach for everybody else to mimic our uh, uh, use. Uh, yeah, and again, I got yeah, uh, it's very important that all the uh, things about re reduction of CO2 and uh, savings and hard disk, it's, uh, that they need to be confirmed by our climate team. So it's just assumptions based on some uh, logic. Yeah, so when you go this uh, 
free and open source uh, software, uh, source uh, software or open source uh, software. Uh, what kind of licenses uh, do you want to go for, right? So, I've been a member of the Free Software Foundation since 2007. So, for me, it's always like FOSS before uh, OSS, right? We went with the lesser GPL, it's because that's one of the licenses that we call permissive or permissive. And Simon told yesterday all are permissive, but, but this is actually really permissive, right? Because you can utilize my library at, at your own risk. That's also important, right? So we don't provide any liability or warranty, but you can use it at your own risk, but you're not forced to open source your work, right? So let's say uh, Volvo or somebody else is utilizing our library, and now we tell them, well, all the things that you have done, now you need to open source it. That will actually have an impact on their intellectual property. So they will probably never ever use a library, right? So, of course, if you use it, however you use it with your related work, it's up to you how you want to uh, license or not license that work, or if you want to open source it or not. But if you find a bug, or if you actually expand the library with some feature, please do a fork, please uh, share that with the rest of the community, right? I think that's a fair uh, request, so let's just make the tool better for everybody. We have done the upfront work and we will keep working on the tool to make it better, but if somebody else find some neat case where they can help us expand it or maybe to do some bug fixing and so on and so forth, yeah, those kind of uh, contributions would be more than welcome. So, uh, since it's a .NET project, it will be uh, the libraries uh, available at uh, nougat.org. Yeah, the name is a bit long. I got a bit of, uh, yeah, I got a bit uh, mentioned that I should probably find another name, but I mean, if I call it like Payotoap, nobody will know, right? That's what we used to do. We just put in an abbreviation and we put like some some names, right? I would rather just say, hey, we're actually taking, taking Apache or other ideals and we transform them into Apache Pirate. I mean, that should be <laughs> understandable. So, besides that, on the GitHub profile, if you want to see what we do in the decode, yeah, you can see that as uh, well. So, I want to do the demo where we can go from these um, definitions. So this is one of the test cases that you can download from, you have the URL, from the official Apache uh, project on GitHub. You can actually uh, define one of, or you can actually download one, download one of these data definitions, which is not really trivial, as you will see in a bit. So you define a protocol, the interop protocol, and that interop protocol has a record, and it has some enum types, and it has some fix, which is 16 bytes, and then you have a record node, which is actually recursive, right? So we have the node, but it also has children, which are the type node. And finally, we have the main interrupt entity, where they just put all the different kind of uh, uh, types that is supported by IDL. So you can probably see that this look very much as Java code, and I would actually kind of claim that it's uh, somehow subset of Java, but Java doesn't have protocol keywords. So, yeah, it, I would say it's heavily inspired by the Java programming language. So, how do we go from this to uh, an ER diagram where we can see how this is represented, right? So, let's take a shell, and now we will run dot bash. Maybe you want to see what's happened before. Yeah, we have plenty of time. So I just want to log what happened, then I will put the resulting output into a folder. Yeah, ensure that it's uh, deleting before. Get the new one, we just run our scripts. And what we are generating, I guess um, people here know what the dot language for graphics is about. So that's a really nice way of being able to describe uh, graphs in a text-based format. Once you have that uh, 
definition in a dot file, you can actually export it to SVG if you want to have uh, vector-based graphs, but you can also just do a PNG. So let's just see how that's going to be. So we can see the dots, interrupt dot. So we will define a graph, and the graph is uh, rank right to left, overlap. I really wanted to do it like center-based, like the star or the snowflake, but I'm probably not that good at uh, dot uh, graphic or uh, graphics uh, dot format. So if somebody knows how to do that, please do a pull request. But we just specify the different vertices and also the edges, or how we combine those tables. Yeah. And then you will see something like this. So dots. And that's the good thing about having a graphical interface here. Now we can actually zoom in. Uh, yes. So we can see our main event interrupt has this unique hash. So when you go to the data lake, you know that for this version, you have to look into this bucket and all the fields that we need to add to the fact tables and the dimension tables in order to have uh, the necessary information on how we can bind them, they are pre prefixed with pj underscore. Uh, the good thing about using this approach is that you're not allowed to have in this uh, ROIDL, uh, the, I think, underscore, a character that will actually break it. So we are somehow home safe, so we cannot actually provide a field that will break uh, this transformation. But, uh, so now we can see all these informations that we had before in the Arduino IDO. They are specified and some of them are nullable and some of them are not nullable. So that's specified as well. So the important part comes here, how we bind the fact table with the dimension table, right? So we can see here that the cardinality of this dimension table is that we will always have a node related to our interrupt. So that means that whenever I'm doing like the join between those two tables in SQL, right, I can use an Eki join because I know that a row and that other dimension table will always be there, right? What we have up here is actually zero or many rows, right? So whenever I do the join, I need to rely on a left join because I could have the uh, row in the table, but I can also uh, not have it, right? And I could have it, but I can also have many of those uh, elements. And yes, the diagrams even support uh, recursive, uh, like the node is actually self-referencing uh, its cell table, right? So we can see that on the children property, we can actually make a join on ourselves, and it's actually a left join as well. So we can have some children, but we could also uh, don't have any children at all, right? So this, how to define a script that creates this, these ER diagrams, we have done that as how to contribute to the project. And that's just because we are exposing some uh, components from the, 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 the library that allows you to make this kind of logic. I guess this could be part of the library because most people would like to have like a visualized or uh, visualization of how uh, the tables are combined with each other versus having to look into these nested uh, ROIDL diagrams, right? Like, uh, what is it, what they say, like uh, an image is worth uh, a thousand words, right? Yeah. So, I hope we have convinced you to see that whatever we have done is not just maybe some superfluous or some crazy uh, theoretical stuff that, ooh, let me implement this stuff and it might not be usable, right? We, 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 we thought that we needed to provide something that was built on some sound and safe approach but that could actually be used in real-life problems, right? And besides that, we also wanted to have some goals uh, uh, upfilled where we can actually say that, yeah, 
we are compliant with our sustainability model. We also like helping, reducing tedious and manual tasks, which most of us don't really do or are not really where well, we don't really like. Right? I mean, that's the reason why we suffer. And yeah, so like the values of uh, Pandora is this uh, thing where we dream, we dare, we care, and we deliver. So sometimes you just do something. Yeah, we care about that. Yeah. We try to make it and then we like deliver, right? So I need to do this. The, the, these values are actually what allows you to think out of the box. And since I work for Pandora, it's thinking out of the Pandora box. Brunches. <laughs> I had to do it. So, yeah. So, do you have any questions? I have a few questions. The first one is the potato, potato omelette with or without onions. Uh, oh, yes. The second question, and on, on a serious note, uh, you were using uh, such 156 hashes in order to calculate the models. Uh, how often do you need to calculate those hashes in your processing? Because uh, some 512 might be more efficient and then you can truncate the hashes. Yeah, so, so the trick is, so the definitions of the data, we only do it once, right? So once we know how we represent some data, we know it by the specifics of the other idea, right? Mm. So we just need to hash that once, and from there we just know how much data we're putting in there. So doing the transformation from, as I say here, from the other idea into our packet schema ST, is might be once, but then we will apply it to maybe one million data elements. So, the hashing is only once. Why did you choose also an hexadecimal representation for the hashes instead of, say, base 64 or something like that? Uh, I think it's just like, we just want to use one hash that doesn't have uh, too many collisions. No, no, I'm not asking why you use 256, but why did you choose hexadecimal for, for, the, for the hash results? Uh, I don't think I understand that question. Uh, basically, why, why are you only using characters from 0 to 9 to F when you could use more characters in order to make the result shorter? Like, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's a good point, that's a good point, yeah. Uh, we can talk about that later. Sure, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my last question, since you seem to be looking for a name, have you considered calling your tool Parketizer? <laughs> <laughs> So, if you go to slide 17, where you showed the transformation from Avro to the, to the parquet data types, for the union, you, you show that you're basically making one big record containing all of those types. Yes. Um, how does that hold up if those types themselves are complex and maybe large types? Uh, does that actually get properly unionized uh, in memory from Parquet or...? So, uh, yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So it's actually recursively, right? So every time we have a T, and if that's a complex T, we will not do that recursively, right? So let's say type 0, it's uh, type 0. If that's one of these elements, it will recursively go down and down and down and down. This is why we have the snowflake schema, right? Where our dimension tables can be contained in each other. So yeah, that's actually correct. I didn't specify that here uh, in the slide. Yes. Maybe as a follow up, uh, I'm more interested in like, will those, t will I now get a record that consumes like the maximum size of those types, or uh, like, is this a sum type or is this a, um, a product type? So, so this is a product type. Each of those uh, elements is actually a property. So they will just be null. You will only have one of okay, those properties set, right? They won't consume memory, actually, if they are not set. Uh, no, so in the column, in Parquet, they will just be set to null. So okay. they will not use okay. any space. Okay. So that's, that's one of the things about Parquet column base. You cannot work in a trivial manner with, uh, with Parquet because Sometimes you will actually just consume a value from another column 
into one row. So if you work row based with Pocket, you're going to get the data wrong. You need to work uh, in, in the column. So th that's why you can utilize this approach with uh, Pocket and not have extra space there. Uh, one comment on union types is that all the other ones, since we have it in this well-defined schema AST, we can add uh, compile type, ensure that we provide you the right Pocket type. But if you go the union type for uh, something that is not the nullable representation of a type, so the nullable representation of a type in Pocket is just null and a type. So that's pretty easy to uh, convert into a nullable type. You just remove the null, you say the type, and it's nullable. That's pretty trivial. But if you have int, double, and so on and so forth, whenever we are dealing with union types, we are going into the runtime model because we need to taste the value at runtime, and then we can actually, uh, by doing some runtime casting, ensure that it goes to the right property. So if you can minimize union to the minimum, then you can have something really, really fast because we decide everything at compile time. But if you rely too much on unions, then we will actually be less uh, performing because we have to do the runtime type casting. So I'm looking for hands before I'm asking my own question. And I, I saw <laughs> one of the guys who made me think of it enter the room. Uh, so when it comes to your sustainability journey, have yes. you considered languages as part of that? Uh, which? Com languages and, and resource utilization and efficiency. Yes, so there's like some ongoing research at Roskilde University and uh, one of my previous friends from Copenhagen University, she's there as an associate professor, and she's doing a lot of uh, research exactly on this one. So it's something like Python uh, uses a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of resources. And if you compare it to, let's say, Rust, Rust outperforms Python, uh, Python. But again, it's how much people do people use to write Rust? How much do you use to that? So it's not. Um, I say it's not an exact science, but it's, 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 it's ongoing, it's something that we need to, not just us, but everybody needs to look into that at some point, right? Yep. So do we have more hands? Otherwise we're slowly running out of time. So a big thank you. Yeah.